Um, hello, everyone. My, my name is Michael Tretter, um, and I will be telling you about the Linux graphics stack and give you an introduction to the Linux graphics stack, especially on embedded devices. Toll. Um, about me. Uh, as said, I'm Michael Tretter. I work as an embedded Linux developer um, at Pengotronics. Pengotronics is an embedded Linux consulting and support company, so we are doing support for Linux. Uh, and there I work in the graphics team, so it's all about graphics, DRM, um, video for Linux, so cameras, encoders, and graphics output to display and GPUs. The Linux graphics stack can be really confusing to a starter. There are many um, acronyms there you can find. Um, for example, uh, Wayland, DRI, DRM, which already sounds the same, but it's different. KMS, FB, EGL, OpenGL. So once you started, you have all these uh, acronyms and it's really difficult to um, bring these together and to understand what's hidden behind these. And I will try to help you to understand how these um, connect together and um, how you can build your model in your mind about the system to understand it better. The focus of this talk will be the Linux APIs. So, I will look into the software components that are um, in Linux and example applications, how you can um, uh, use DRM um, and graphics and how you can, uh, I can remove this, um, and uh, how, uh, which example applications you can use to look uh, into the graphics stack, debug it, and see if something is working or if it isn't. Um, most of this talk will be platform independent. There are, by the nature of the hardware, um, some platform dependent things like display controllers, GPUs. I will point that out, but I will try to keep it as generic across different platforms so that it works the same for, um, for uh, a rock chip or IMX6 or Intel or whatever you have encounter. The agenda of the talk will be three steps. In the first step, we will be trying to bring a pixel buffer to the display. That means we have some buffer that's filled with color data and bring it out to the display. As a second step, we will be drawing pixels into this color buffer, into this buffer. So we have some nice image we can bring to the display. And in a third step, we will be composing different pixel buffers into one single pixel buffer that can be sent to the display. So um, I wanted to show this on uh, ROC3 uh, hardware with an RK3568. Um, uh, it's not booting right now, so I have some backup of what I wanted to show, but unfortunately we won't be looking at a live system because demos never work. Um, this is a um, nice platform. So um, yesterday in the showcase we um, saw, uh, we presented the um, Evil Kit based on the same SOC. Um, this one is uh, Razza um, ROC3 which you can actually buy, which is cheaper than the Eval kit, and you can run um, a mainline kernel with graphics output and GPU acceleration on that. So if I go into a hardware-specific stuff, um, this will be based on this Rockchip platform. Step one, bring a pixel buffer onto the display. So what usually happens here to bring pixels to the display is that the application um, first draws pixels into some buffer, so it's some memory, and it um, puts them as RGB or NV12, so in some specified format, the um, 
writes the color of each pixel. For example, it may just go through the, each line of this buffer and put the um, color it wants there. Um, then this pixel buffer must be sent to the display controller, which is responsible for driving the display. And the display must be configured to correctly interpret the data in this buffer um, for the display. So the color format, the size, um, the stride, which means um, how long are the lines of this buffer, all of this has to be configured in the, um, uh, in, for, in the display controller to correctly interpret the otherwise meaningless data. First, acronyms. So we already saw some on the introduction slide. Um, DI means direct rendering infrastructure. DI is the overall uh, thing um, and infrastructure of the Linux graphics stack. So um, this is everything, the infrastructure. The direct ma rendering manager is the kernel component of DRI, so DRM is part of DRI. KMS is the kernel mode setting. This is part of DRM, which is especially um, responsible for driving a display. So mode setting is exactly configuring the display for, um, um, uh, for the data in the pixel buffers. So this is done um, with KMS. And as a last term, FB, that means frame buffer. So this is um, the correct name for the pixel buffer. So if I use frame buffer or pixel buffer, this is usually exchangeable. Note that um, when I use FB or frame buffer, this is not DevFB or the uh, FB Dev um, subsystem, which is an old um, and deprecated uh, interface to graphic uh, to yeah, displays in the Linux kernel. If you want to know more about that and DRM, I uh, may guide you to talk by Gerd on Friday. So. Again, the display stack, we see um, the uh, display on the bottom. DRM, as I said, as the kernel component. On top of that, we have libdrm, which provides um, C helpers for um, interacting with the kernel. And on top of that, we, um, I will show you um, output from mode test which allows you to uh, look into the DRM driver for driving the display, especially KMS and what it provides to you. In DRM, we have, um, so as uh, said, the display um, and the display controller um, drive the display are usually part of the SOC. So these are platform dependent, uh, the display controller, and you have some part in the DRM driver, which is also responsible for driving exactly this display controller, so it has to be platform dependent as well. More exactly, it depends on the display controller, so you might have the same display controller on different SOCs, but consider it as platform specific. And KMS, as said, is the interface to the user space um, for driving the display and DRM. Let's see if I can show you something here. So as said, um, mode test is, um, uh, is a tool to um, set a mode via KMS on the display. Um, but it also provides you information about um, the, the display controller, the connected display, etc. It has to um, provide it because otherwise it, couldn't be, it wouldn't be able to set valid modes. The output of um, mode test may look like this. Can you uh, see the output? So is it readable? Okay, perfect. Um, 
in. Um, so this, what you see here, is more or less the output of the command on the left, the mode test minus m rock chip, which says we are running on a rock chip platform. Um, let's go to the next slide. On top, we see the encoders. Um, you can also see it here. So this is uh, some outdated construct which is exposed to user space, so we cannot get rid of that, but we will ignore it. That's everything to encoders. The um, second um, part here is um, a connector. So here we um, see the output of an HDMI connector, and it um, it says um, it's connected, so some display is connected to HDMI, and it read the edit of the display to find out which modes are supported. So we can see um, the display I connected while doing this um, as some um, 1920 times um, 1200 pixel size or full HD with different uh, frame rates. So that's um, information you can retrieve uh, with mode test. Let's go further down. So you see a lot of modes. Um, here you see the blob of the edit. Um, some further information. Yeah. And that's, that's what you can see about encoders and uh, connectors in with mode test. The more interesting part from a software perspective are the CRTCs. The CRTC is um, an abstraction for the display controller itself. Um, so display controllers may compose a different planes and build the final buffer that's sent to the display. And um, you configure the CRTC to build the buffer that's sent out. Um, so we, in, on the top, we see um, that we configured a mode already. So the one with the highest resolution. And we have various planes that are composed by the CRTC or the display controller with um, different pixel formats. So here you have to configure the planes and the CRTC according to the data you want to show um, on your display. Um, and as a fi uh, final step to um, actually put data there, you have to allocate these frame buffers with FBs. And in your configuration, you tell your display controller, OK, take this frame buffer, put it on this plane, and show it. Exactly. That's what I wanted to tell you about. Um, as said, DRM is a kernel module. So you have further debugging information about the kernel module available via the sysfs and the debugfs. So you find in the path um, that are shown here more information about the connection status. You can read the edit there as well. So this is the information exposed by the kernel without going through mode test or some user space component. And um, for debugging the kernel, um, you have some speciality in DRM. So you have a parameter um, which is called debug um, to enable different flags for debugging the DRM driver. There I um, enable all the flags, but check the DRM driver in the kernel for the meaning of each flag so you can um, have a more fine-grained um, configuration of that. So that's um, how we bring the pixels to the display. Um, as a next step, um, we want to draw pixels into the buffer that we sent out to the display. 
doing this with the CPU and going by each pixel can be really slow. And for running at higher frame rates, we have, a, um, we have a deadlines for each buffer when it has to be finished. So this um, might work, but for higher resolutions, it usually doesn't. Also, coping frames by pixels on the CPU can be slow. It's just more or less the same as drawing because you have to take it from one buffer, put it to the other, um, write it through all your caches, and this might take some time. So that's usually um, why there are, or that's why there are hardware accelerators for writing pixels to a buffer. So all this um, writing and drawing of a picture uh, is uh, hardware accelerated. Again, some more uh, acronyms. The API to applications for using hardware accelerators, I'm, from now on, I'm using GPUs as a term for that. So it's gra graphics processing units. These are usually the hardware accelerators. Um, first, OpenGL is the API to applications. So applications use OpenGL to do some uh, rendering. That's uh, currently the case. There is um, OpenGL is more or less uh, deprecated and uh, superseded by Vulkan, but it's not that broadly used yet, so we will be uh, focusing on OpenGL. Um, a GLSL is the shading language. So you write some uh, shaders for um, what the GPU should do. And you write these shader, pro shader programs in a GSL, a GLSL. And the third um, is EGL, which is the interface between OpenGL and your native platform graphics interface. What this means, we will see in a few seconds. Here we um, see uh, again a uh, diagram of the graphics stack now including OpenGL. Um, on the left hand side, um, we have uh, KMS. So we still have to put something on the display with KMS. Um, this is everything we saw before, just boiled down to this is the kernel interface. Um, the application uh, then has to get the buffer that's um, put on the display on some, some way. That's um, GB, GBM. So it can take a frame buffer that's allocated via KMS and wrap it into a GBM object. That's just some more or less internal representation. This G, GBM object further goes um, through um, some DRM component in, um, so everything of that is implemented in MISO. Um, goes through some DRM component, which is especially for interacting with KMS or DRM drivers. And um, some interface that's called DRI2, not to be confused with um, direct rendering interface, which is the overall thing, but it's the same, just an implementation. It's difficult with the naming, but this is um, an impl implementation of an internal interface. And on top of that, you have EGL. So you get the frame buffer via KMS, put it through GBM, DRM, DRI, EGL, and now you have an EGL um, image that's a uh, um, high level representation of your frame buffer that you will put on the display. And this EGL image you can put to OpenGL and render um, to it with OpenGL. Um, OpenGL, um, as said, abstracts the, the GPU. The GPU is platform specific. Again, GPU specific, but it might differ between your platforms. Um, on the ROC chip platform that I have here, um, the GPU is supported by the Panfrost driver. Um, it's a Mali GPU. Where is it? Uh. So this implementation um, of OpenGL is, um, again, platform specific. All of that over here is, um, 
is a Linux interfaces and works the same on all platforms. Um, as an example application, um, we uh, used KMS, or I used KMS Cube, which is a really a simple application to access KMS and to use, uh, use um, OpenGL to render something. So not much is happening there. It's just an example application. For um, debugging the generic MESA implementation, you can use um, environment variables. So for um, debugging what's going on in MESA, you might set, for example, EGL log level, so it um, logs what's going on in uh, EGL. Or you might dump the GSLS, uh, GLSL um, shaders that the application uses. So um, you can look into what's, uh, what's OpenGL's um, shaders, uh, what sh OpenGL shaders look like that the application is using. You can look further down into Mesa in the platform specific part. So the shaders have to be compiled to some GPU specific machine, machine language. Um, for looking into what your driver is doing, you can use other um, environment variables. They are usually prefixed with a driver name and Mesa debug. Um, then you can see raw shaders or see what optimizations the, GP, the driver is doing to your um, shaders for running in the GPU. Um, again, if you have a different platform, the um, variable's name may, might be diff may be different. Check the Mesa source, usually the, uh, the options and the uh, environment variables are documented there. Um, now we have a problem that KMS and the display um, can be only driven by a single application. That's by design, only one application can, um, can drive the display. Um, that's called DRM master. So if you are running a second application that tries to access um, DRM because you want to um, use a second application on a different plane, for example, um, you might receive a uh, permission denied error when starting the application, and that's usually the, uh, caused by the second application not being the DRM master. Furthermore, um, toolkits like um, GTK, Qt, um, don't support direct interaction with um, KMS. Um, and applications as well. That's because most of the time it doesn't do what you actually want and um, if you have multiple applications, it just doesn't work. Therefore, um, we need a window compositor that takes the different applications, puts them together into a single buffer and sends it out to the display. Um, that's where a Wayland comes in. So we have one, uh, we have, um, here, uh, the KMS, we already saw this on the previous slides. We have some Wayland compositor running on top of KMS and multiple applications, the Wayland clients um, on top of the Wayland compositor. The Wayland clients and the compositor interact with, with, with each other via Wayland protocols, which are specified uh, yeah, various uh, um, protocols for especially specified for this interaction. Um, in my examples, I will use a Weston, which is the reference implementation of um, a Wayland compositor. It's usable, but n not really usable for desktop use cases. So you have different um, Wayland compositors, if you look into your, uh, into your machines. So if you use GNOME, you might have Mata as a compositor. With KDE, you have KWIN, or there are various compositors based on WL roots like Sway and Cage. So these are all implementations of Wayland compositors. Um, here we see um, different um, present representation of the diagram we saw before. We have DRM and uh, KMS in the bottom, like with KMS cube. 
we have the Wayland compositor Weston running on KMS. Some Wayland client, the simple EGL application um, running um, as well um, and interacting with the Western compositor with the Wayland protocol. So when I, here, Wayland is actually a Wayland protocol. Um, so Western can be uh, run by just typing Western on the command line and it should just fire up. Um, it prints some debugging output. I won't go into details right now. Um, and uh, Western supports um, debug protocols for debugging. So you can enable the debug protocols with a dash dash debug parameter. And then you can use Western debug with different debugging streams to, um, to see what Western is actually doing. For example, one debugging stream is backend DRM, which is exactly the implementation um, or the component of Western that uses KMS. So if you look at this stream, you will see um, what Western does with the planes, what color of, uh, pic uh, pixel formats it sets on the planes, and in general, how Western interacts with KMS. So if there is something strange on the display and you're expecting that Western is doing something wrong, look at this debugging stream. Um, there are further tools for debugging Wayland. Wayland Info is a client application that connects to your Wayland compositor and shows you which protocols are supported in which versions. So you can use this to um, get information about your Wayland compositor and what can be used um, in your application of the compositor here. So, um, as said, you have the protocols. For, um, these are quite important for because the applications are using it to talk to the compositor, to look into what the application sends to the compositor and receives as responses. You might set this Wayland debug environment variable. So you get all the messages that are sent between the client and the server and see if something is surprising there. And on, that's for debugging the client side, so what the client is seeing. You have as well a, a compositor. Um, the compositor has to interact with um, clients as well via the protocols for debugging the server, uh, the compositor perspective of the Wayland protocol. You might use uh, uh, Western debug again with a proto stream which shows you all the protocol messages that the, uh, that the compositor is seeing. So that's um, useful for debugging the interaction between a Wayland client and a Wayland server. This might look familiar. Um, we want um, applications to draw into pixel buffers as well. These are not um, frame buffers that are directly sent to, those, um, to the display but are sent to the Wayland compositor for compositing. So we have different pixel buffers that are later composited. Now I will start on top. So we have a simple EGL, which uses OpenGL. That's the same as with KMS Cube. And the difference, um, yeah, buffers are um, abstracted as EGL images and DRI. But here we don't have the um, DRM platform, but now we have a Wayland platform on the client side. And this Wayland platform, instead of um, using uh, frame buffers from KMS, it uses um, Wayland, uh, buffers provided, uh, uh, it uses yeah, uh, buffers that are sent um, via a Wayland to Wayland protocols to the uh, display composite, uh, to the Wayland compositor. But for the application, it almost looks the same. So everything happens down here in Mesa, which detects, oh, I'm not running on KMS, but I'm running as a Wayland client. Um, so 
So as a summary, um, now, uh, now we are connecting the terms that we saw in the beginning. So we have, again, OpenGL, which is the abstraction for using GPUs. We have EGL, which is used to provide buffers to OpenGL and into which we can render. All of this is part of the direct rendering infrastructure, which is the overall term. We have Wayland uh, for, um, for passing buffers that are allocated from, by the clients to some Wayland compositor for composing it into a final buffer. We have DRM as the kernel component that um, is our driver um, for, um, is the kernel component of the uh, DRI infrastructure. We have KMS, which is the display, uh, the part, the API that drives the display as part of DRM. And we have um, frame buffers, which are the buffers that we can pass to, uh, through DRM to a display and uh, yeah, have something we can show on the display. Okay, um, that's um, about my talk. And um, there are two further talks about um, DRM, uh, one right in the afternoon and one later in the afternoon. Um, if you want a different perspective on DRM, you might attend there as well. And yeah, you can reach me via my mail address. I will be around here. So uh, thank you. And if I get the demo running, we might as well look into the commands that I showed and see it on a live system. So if you're interested in that, maybe catch me up and let's see if we can do something there. Uh, thank you. Any questions, comments, disagreements? Uh, yep. Uh, I saw you had multiple lines from the application into the uh, next layer. So it, does it mean that application can directly talk OpenGL or EGL or Meta? So the question was in, um, here, for example, that there are um, multiple lines um, to EGL and OpenGL, um, and if the application has to use um, or has to directly talk to EGL and OpenGL, uh, the answer is yes. The application is responsible, for example, for allocating the EGL buffer, uh, EGL images, so it has to talk EGL and it has to talk OpenGL, and in the previous, um, example with GBM, it also has to um, explicitly use GBM there as well. So it, it's not that it can use all of them, it actually has to use them. Okay, I, I don't see any hands anymore. Oh, yeah. I found, um, regarding the Mesa package as a whole, So the question is, um, here we see the Panfrost driver um, as part of Mesa, and the question is, are other GPUs supported as Mesa as well, and do vendors upstream their drivers to Mesa? Um, and there are other drivers, so usually Mesa is the umbrella project for all the GPU drivers in Linux, and upstream drivers usually go there. Vendor, if vendors provide upstream drivers, they should use Mesa as well. 
So that's the way to go. You get all the um, goodies around that, the EGL abstraction, OpenGL optimizers, mm, some optimizers there as well. So you, if you want to upstream your driver, go to Mesa. Usually vendors don't do that. They have their own um, uh, user space blob for that. And also the kernel driver is usually not um, DRM or not in the DRM infrastructure. Thank you. Ah, back there. Um, so the question is here, um, there is, uh, if there is a, a direct path from the GPU to the display. So um, from a software perspective, it's not. But um, in the kernel, you have um, DMA buff, which is exactly an abstraction to pass a buffer that's, allocated, that's used by the GPU to the display driver. So in the, in the software stack, you don't pass it directly, but it's actually passed directly underneath the layers and um, not copied. Does that answer your question? So it sounds like some file descriptor? Yeah. It's called, called DMA buff. It's a concept in the kernel, and it's exposed via file descriptor, but it's handled by Mesa, so you don't actually do uh, do it yourself in your application. Thanks. Yeah. What do you say is the fastest way to get a buffer from the GPU that is to be displayed on the display uh, to the main memory, for example, to stream it somewhere? The question is um, the uh, about the fastest way from the GPU to the main memory. I think you mean if you have some specific video, um, video memory on the GPU. Yes, or for example, for screen sharing. Or for screen share. Um, that depends on your hardware. <laughs> that's all I can say about that. So that's really... Um, uh, completely hardware dependent so um, and and uh, with um, and use case dependent so for streaming you would use some nv12 format for encoding for example so if you do h264 encoding for your streaming you want to use it have it in nv12 which is a planar format um, this is not optimal for displaying it on most of the gpus some have support for that. That, again, depends on the display controller. Um, if you can display such a buffer, um, usually you cannot um, write with your GPU into such a buffer. So um, that really depends on your use case, your limitations, and what your hardware can do. Okay. I think I saw a question. Uh, historical reason, but that happened before I was involved there. <laughs> okay, I think we have to stop now. Uh, thanks again for all your questions, and see you around. Bye. <laughs>